The single camera sitcom Homeschooled is my latest hidden gem that I found on Pure Flix, which is the evangelical Christian streaming service that doesn't need to be reminded to put the Christ back in Christmas, which is why I can trust its wholesome, family-friendly content to keep me laughing all holiday season long, especially when I need to shake off the stress of fighting on the liberal side of the war against Christmas, which involves making Molotov cocktails out of the Starbucks holiday cups and using them to destroy voting centers and rich neighborhoods. Beverly Hills, you better watch out because St. Nick is coming and he ripped the plates off his Prius. Unlike some of the other content we've broken down from Pure Flix, with Homeschooled, I really saw the dream and I could pretty much understand what the writers were going for with this show centered around a slightly dysfunctional family brought together by an unexpected tragedy. And for the most part, I'm happy to say that I was very impressed with the final result that came out of this ambitious idea for a miniseries. Having said that, it is not exactly exactly Showtime premium cable production quality, so I did have plenty of notes on this precocious cast, not so creative cinematography, and a low budget that makes itself known in everything from the undecorated, fresh from the bank foreclosure interior set designs, to the weirdly empty crowd scenes, and a shooting schedule that must have been moving faster than the second coming of Christ. That was three days, right? Like one weekend of Coachella? Let me know as we get sacked with a house full of orphans and child actors, and another Pure Flix original sitcom Com installment of Clip Breakdown. Ha. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content found on the web. And we divide it into separate clauses like your dead dad's will and testament to figure out are we really financially responsible for this or can we get off without having to change any diapers. And that's basically the storyline of today's show. Surprise adoption and how it can be forced on you. And we're gonna make sure we all know how to arm ourselves against this dangerous phenomenon of children coming into your life that you have to learn to love. Not this gay. But before we do, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see more Pure Flix breakdowns like this throughout the holiday season. There's plenty of Christmas stuff on there. And most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. Notifications on, please. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon. So the synopsis for this show is a self-centered woman from the city has to move to Ohio to take care of her adopted brothers and sisters. That's all you need to know. What in the iMovie 5 are those titles trying to do? Menacing us from the lower third of the screen like that. Lower third? Don't you know that's the area hell would be if the TV were showing a map of the Christian universe? It's heaven, earth, a guacamole layer of purgatory, and then hell. Besides, if I wanted to see little kids' faces with their names printed in Comic Sans, I would have become a school teacher, where I would start every day by showing a similar looking PowerPoint of my top three favorite students of the minute, as well as my flop three least attentive parents of the month. Ricky, Jessica, Michael, I saw all three of your parents at the mall this weekend and none of them looked believably excited to run into me. So come up to my desk at snack time and I'll tell you what Christmas presents they were buying for you. You're the top three. I also will offer babysitting. So if you're interested in that, leave your name and address and social security in the public comments below. That's a joke, don't do it. Life alert. After that, a beautiful stringy guitar thrummy theme, we get to go into the actual show where we meet our main character, Hannah Meeks. When I was a little girl, I hated loud noises. I'd cover my ears and count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And by then your Xanax for kids would kick in and you could really open up and feel the warmth of God's light on your face. Sorry, or whatever natural, holistic, your religious parents and you could believe in enough to get a comparable placebo effect. Probably like barley and milk or something. Good luck with whatever mild bowel discomfort that must be causing. With this shot, you can tell they are loving that bounce card, which is where they have someone in front of the camera holding a big, probably silver card in this case to catch that light that we see flaring from behind 
behind her and bounce it right up into her face. That's how you get that warm illuminated glow. You can see it in a lot of exteriors while walking, but I like for the look of a big silk, if you can, behind the camera, a big white sheet. It just gives a more natural bounce, but that takes a lot more setup and time and room on the street. So this is good for like a run and gun situation. When I talk about there being harsh shadows under people's eyes, this is how you fix it. So I appreciate it. Although it feels like we're maybe getting off a little too much in sort of an early graduate from film school type of way on that lens flare and just like the glow on her face in general, because it starts to all look a little hazy and milky to me, which mm, that doesn't actually carry through the rest of the show. So I would have maybe shot it a little more straightforward. I don't know what city this is. It looks like New York to me. It could easily be something near Ohio. Anyway, I would have liked to see more of the landscape, the cityscape. I guess that's just me, the control freak. Look out everyone, we have your standard Pure Flix non-believer. Look at her clomping down the sidewalk with her smart gadget and those garish, whorish black ballet flats. Off to her important office job where she gets fulfillment from her career. And I guess wearing a Halloween witch cape tied around her neck for some reason. Okay, fashion. Maybe that's fashion in Ohio. <laughs> Sorry. I know it's not. You know this woman is too busy for God because she's taking calls while walking down the street. Yeah, no, 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 no. What? Um, you just said, yeah, no, 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 no. And then I started to speak and then you said, what? So you just let me know when you're done saying no really fast and then I'll go. And she's like, yeah, no, 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 no. I love fake talking on the phone. I can even see her lock screen when she's walking down there with that iPhone, but it's okay. Maybe it's a message from God and that's just like the special hand gesture. There's their secret handshake to be a conduit. Back in her busy office where she has a draft that needs to get done, Hannah gets a call from somebody right as a man, gentleman caller with flowers steps into her office, but something is not quite right. <laughs> You're gonna have to reschedule dinner. That's too bad. Reservations at O'Malley's? took months. Can I just say, you both nailed this dialogue. For a second there, I almost completely believed that you were two human beings having a conversation about meals. And that a place called O'Malley's could ever have a months long wait list. What's good there, fish and chips? Also, if your significant other said this to you after hanging up the phone, wouldn't you be like, are you okay? Is everything okay? Not, that's too bad. O'Malley's with months. Anyway, sorry to do an impression of you, actor, young actor person. Uh, I feel like I just drank that like a full on chipmunk crazy town. After I shoot this video, it's Thanksgiving break, y'all. I don't know when you're watching this in the future, but here in the present, it's uh, coming up. That's when Hannah shares the news that her father has passed away in Ohio. But through the conversation, we learned that she was never really close to him, but the boyfriend does seem like he wants to help. Max? And I'm like, are you the new dog of a white family in a 90s movie? I wanted a dog. I'm white, I know. I wanted a dog named Max. It was simple and clean, like on TV. Um, anyway, he offers to come and she's like, no, no, let me just go handle this. They, the lawyer says they need to talk to me in person. So she flies out to the house and is suddenly in Ohio and she shows up at her father's house and meets the lawyer named Mateo. You knew him well? Too well. Youngest lawyer at the firm and he still chose me. Okay, so you're the youngest lawyer at the firm. I guess that explains why nobody in this entire show's universe is over the age of 25. Did Mateo somehow attend law school at age 18 and then pass the bar exam on his way over here? Or are these just the only actors who could do this for free because they just graduated from theater school and needed stuff for the real? Either way, I don't think the acting is bad. I think it is a little bit lacking in experience maybe. It feels like they're playing for stage a tad uh, with their pauses and their delivery and it's just a little bigger than you would normally expect to see for camera, but that's not necessarily their fault. The director's job is to really get the best performance out of them, so who's to say? And Mateo here, I was looking at his IMDb acting all the time in Ohio, and I'm sure the same could be said for the rest of the cast, so no shade. And in this scene, I feel like the lighting is good. Like, look at Mateo's face. Everything is evenly lit. Even with Hannah there, she has like the light motivated from the window on the key side of her face, but then the fill side or the shadow side is not super dark. You know, it's still exposed correctly. The color temperatures are mixing, but it's not affecting the color of her skin. This is when Hannah gets the news that's gonna disrupt her plans a little bit as a busy woman who hates the Lord and Jesus. You, Hannah Meeks, are to be the sole guardian of his children. I'm sorry, it, it sounds like you told me I just inherited kids. That is 
more or less correct. No, Mateo, it's actually feeling less and less correct with every tiny little mouth that this woman is now legally saddled with having to feed. Doesn't that seem like the kind of legal document that would require a signature from both parties? If I was Hannah, I would tell this lawyer, listen, you called my grandfather godly, so that means you probably met him at church or some weird we both know that I can call your bluff by abandoning these kids. And then it will be you who's morally obligated to feed them macaroni and cheese every day for the rest of your life, not me. She should know how the system works. She's a savvy businesswoman with drafts and desks and folders and papers. We've only seen one of the kids so far, the one who answered the door, Prue, the moody oldest one, and the rest of the kids she's bringing up for them to meet. This is Hannah Meeks, your sister. Hi, sis. Hiya. My name is Benjamin. Oh boy, they're all gonna have their own little personalities and everything, aren't they? Okay, child actors, you take the stage and I'll carefully toe the line between making fun of a show with kids in it and making fun of the kids in the show. I get the difference, okay? Not that it's a perfect science because I will still get messages sometimes from people letting me know that using adult humor within 100 miles of a children's movie makes me very naughty and I must stop. Like, okay, nothing lets me know that you're a Gen X mom faster than a long, disappointed email. So I'm probably not gonna change my whole personality just so that Radio Disney wants to syndicate the f***ing show next time, okay? And that's the way I sang it on a Thanksgiving Eve tonight. So we just met one of the kids, Michael, Matthew, Jacob. I forgot the, a lot of the boys' names, but, oh right, there's Prue, the moody teen who resents Hannah because she ever left Ohio in the first place. And then there's Charity with the braids and then cute little Eva. After taking a moment in the restroom to collect herself, Hannah and Mateo have this conversation about the kid's future. I'll have my lawyer give you a call. And I'll be available this afternoon. In the meantime, get to know them. After all, they are your siblings. And finish reading that will, only to discuss that immediately. As opposed to a regular citizen, would I be in more legal trouble for pepper spraying a lawyer I just met for making a smarmy face at me? Is it like that time I said F you to a cop in Times Square? What, so now assault can be verbal all of a sudden? Where was that logic when people were calling me a f in gym class. Also, let's get a grip society. I didn't know that a badge and a gun made you a demigod. Oh wait, yes I did. Police? The police system, racist f all of it. After the lawyer leaves, Hannah goes down in the basement and just tries to get a grip on the situation with the kids. She doesn't talk. What? Exactly. You know nothing about us. We're just some poor little peasant children to you. She's like, well, I know for a fact that you're poor because I'm in your house right now with two eyes and a nose. We know that Prue is the angsty, moody teenager in the family because she's dressed like one of the January 6th insurrectionist ladies who were bragging about treason on their essential oil Facebook groups. That being said, doesn't she even realize that she's 15 and needs somebody to like shop and cook and take her to her doctor's appointments for another four years, I would be like, great. Someone who knows how to do laundry and take care of a baby. I'm gonna go to my friend's house. She seems like too eager to me to like take on the role of mother for her whole family at that age. I would be like, no, no, let's get an adult in the room. But hey, maybe everyone's different. I'm here because-, because Daddy died? No, I'm, I'm sorry, look, please don't, don't cry, okay? Just I think those are seasonal allergy tears, not grief, because she is really digging into that socket with her index finger, isn't she? Charity, sweetheart, please don't rub your eye like that. Let me grab you a screwdriver from the garden shed. It's much more precise. Hannah thinks that she gets the peace when she's like, I'll just order pizza every and chill, but the kids are yelling and screaming and she's like, oh, one, the Mississippi, two, Mississippi, and that's how the episode ends. Not the strongest stopping point for episode one. I think episode two does a better job for me of like, having a structure that makes me excited for the rest of the season. So I would have tried to make what was effective about episode two and bring it over to episode one, but we'll talk about it. Let's get into it. Oh, but I also did notice the clever writing that, you know, in the Bible, they say the meek shall inherit. This is Hannah Meeks and she's inheriting the earth, meaning these kids. Kids are the world. That's what I got out of it. Let's see what happens with episode two. Okay, so episode two begins with the whole family sat on the couch before the wake. Now to me, if you tell me that in the first episode, the dad dies and all of this crazy stuff ends up happening at a wake. I'm like, that's a really strong first episode. But when you kind of break it up where she's like, she meets the kids and then the next episode is the wake. Like, I'm just not sure that the ending where she kind of fell back and was like, well, this is my life now, was enough of a cliffhanger to keep every viewer going. I wanna give people like the biggest possible cliffhanger so that they're like, oh, I get what this show is about. I get what each episode is generally gonna be. And I know what the premise is going forward. But 
then also you realize there's like character arcs being set up that you want to see followed through. And all of that gets started in this next episode. Let's watch. I'll skip past those gosh darn video yearbook end credits, beginning credits, main theme, whatever. Are you holding up? I've been better, but I've been worse. Good to know. I have a note for every actor on Earth. You're talking too slow. Actually, no, you're talking the right speed, but you leave a pause between every two words. I promise you, Mateo, that's not going to stretch this out into a 22 minute episode. So we're pretty much stuck in the digital world here. Let's accept it. It's short form content, baby. That's cool. It doesn't matter that your TV show can be eight TikToks. Again, this is my favorite concept we've seen for a pure flick show and the best, I think, and most successful execution of it in like demonstrating its concept to the audience and being like, here's why you should tune in. And I was like, oh, at eight minutes each, I'm down to watch all of the seasons of this. And if every episode's gonna have a little adventure like in episode two, then I would be excited to see what happens next. You tell me if you feel the same way because some people it's bad enough to turn away just because the cinematography is really low budget or the art direction as we see with those sets and the casting. I have a few notes about that. It's confusing at some times. Let's get into it. You can see. Bro won't let us until the guests are gone. Hey! We sing soon. Sing. Father wanted his death to be a celebration. What's your funeral with a little fun? Ow! See, these kids don't even need an adult guardian. The oldest sibling, Prue, is perfectly capable of starving and hurting them by herself. I promise you, Hannah's not gonna do any better of a job at withholding their food or pinching them. They send the kids off to go eat and Hannah and Mateo catch up. I just wanna say, all of that food looks like it's from Costco. You know, like they just got some fried chicken and we're like, that can be cold right here. I still wanna eat all of it. Like, I love funeral food. What can I say? It's just the kids, they remind me so much of the life that I tried to escape. They don't know any different. Maybe you were brought to them for such a time as this. What? Esther, 414. My name is Hannah and it's 10.06 AM. Why does everyone keep saying the wrong names and times in this house? So dumb. I would have completely misunderstood this advice and been like, you're right, Mateo. I was brought here for a reason, to deprogram these children of their strict religious upbringing. Kids, pile into my no license plate Prius. We're going to drag brunch. Why are you all crying? I said your father's wake is canceled. Once the funeral starts, I'm like, okay, we didn't get a whole lot of extras for this scene, did we? Because aside from seeing one woman in one scene, it feels like there's nobody in the scene who doesn't have a speaking line. Maybe that's a COVID thing, but I'm pretty sure this came out in 2019. So I think it's just, we couldn't get extras type of thing. And when I was making movies, this was always the hardest part was getting a nice, healthy room full of extras with the right look. You know, cause you have to have them show up for basically no money to be on set. And like most people don't care enough, even if they want to be actors to show up and stand around for eight hours. So it's tough. They try to make it work. They shuffle people around. Either way, this funeral is wild and out. Sorry about that, Meeks. Didn't see it. No, after you. Of course. Turn the other cheek, am I right? <laughs> Did that redhead just bully you at your own father's funeral? Damn, vacation Bible school has gotten really vicious in the age of TikTok. Don't worry, shy kid with a center part. In about 10 years, even your most vicious high school bullies will probably end up sending you a message on Facebook saying sorry and admitting it was all because they had a crush. Believe me, it will be very satisfying and completely worth the wait, so. Don't kill yourself. I also feel like in this scene, Prue did not have enough space on set to do this stomp around angry blocking. I get that she was supposed to be like the protective older sister, but she had to take like stage walks, you could tell from the sound of those clanking heels. Do you think we can have her do that in her socks and maybe control the sound of footsteps in post? Those are the types of things that always get me. I'm like, if I were a sound designer, like I assume they had someone listening to the sound on set, I would be like, okay, yeah, every time she takes a step, it's like having the clapper in my face. So maybe put some moleskin on the bottom of the shoes. That's another sound design trick or just take them off since you're not gonna see them. Dampening footsteps is important. Also with the sound design, I feel like they could sell that there are more people here by giving me some sound design with people talking in the background, plates, people eating, maybe taking a couple crew members, having them moving in front of these windows as light sources, just to show that there are shadows and figures in the room. The youngest kid, Andy, has lost his little pet frog, Clarence. So that's like one of the situations of this party. We gotta find the frog, Clarence. Meanwhile, Hannah is running into some people from her past that she's been trying to avoid. How long has it been? 10 years? Uh, 11. That long? 
I married Robbie Fisher. You married Bobby Fisher, the 11th world chess champion and childhood chess prodigy? Oh, you said Robbie Fisher, the guy who works at Jiffy Lube. Good for you. And is that an engagement ring from the fashion jewelry section of Macy's? I'm jealous. Jealous! I'm so jealous of your fashion jewelry. I'm so jealous! Hannah sees Clarence, the frog, on one of the guests' heads, and that's when all the kids come together for a little family meeting. We actually have another problem I found, Clarence. Great, where? There. Oh. Yeah, okay, so you two go get Clarence. I will find Charity. I'll find Charity. Or you could find Eva. She's lost too. Go team. Is it just a coincidence that Prue and this guest with a frog on her head both got ready with the same size barrel on their curling iron? What are the odds? This was the point when the charm of homeschooled really kicked in for me. I don't like that title, by the way. Homeschooled in the past tense makes it a little hard to say. Homeschool, yes. Maybe homeschooling. I get why they said schooled, but say homeschooled out loud and you'll see why it doesn't really feel good. But this is when homeschooled sold me. On whatever wacky adventures this ragtag family of meeks would would be, have throughout the rest of the season. I think that initial hook is really important for any sort of series like this. So I commend them for getting that on the second episode and also being able to demonstrate for the audience the longevity where you're like, oh, I get it. Every sort of uh, episode will be like a new thing where the family has to like get it together. And she's like, go team. I start to get this like vibe where it's sort of like shameless on Showtime, Malcolm in the middle, the middle. A lot of times on Modern Family, they'll play into this like, we're the wacky, crazy family that is just just like making our way. So it's always sunny in Philadelphia kind of has that feel, although it's also a workplace comedy. You get it. So anyway, I think that they did get over the initial hurdle of proving how this show could be fun and how it has legs. Although I do feel strongly that they could have made this the premise of the first episode. Like it took no time for her to get over to the home in the first episode from the city. So why couldn't they have just like cut out that middle part with meeting the family and like had her show up to the wake. And then like if she arrived at the wake and met the kids at this public setting, then it already starts to feel a little more cinematic. Like you're meeting in public. What's that gonna be like? Maybe there's drama and she has to go down to the basement to find them. And then afterwards, when the party's over is when Mateo gives the news that, oh, you're gonna have to take care of them. I feel like that's a great sequence of action. So that's how I would have edited that. They could have still been eight minute episodes. It's fun to play around with the elements in there. Once you feel like they have all the basic parts, it's gonna be like, well, how could we rearrange what you have to make it still work, but maybe just hook us a little faster. Faster. So that's how I would do it. Let me know if you agree with that in the comments below. When Hannah is looking for charity, she sees her go out to the barn with a picture of her parents and she follows her. I miss you, daddy. You too, mommy. This is for you. And then she takes a big right there in the middle of the freezing cold barn. I'm just kidding. She dances, ballet, I presume. It's hard to tell without ever seeing any of her footwork. More on that in a second. Back inside, the kids are trying to harness Clarence. We appreciate your sympathy. I, I know you're mourning right now, but this too shall pass. Wow, I don't know whose mom this lady is, but she makes these orphan kids look like Haley Joel Osment in Sixth Sense. Suddenly they all just got Golden Globes and Oscar nominations. Not Frog Lady though. She gets a $50 Amazon gift certificate and an Uber home. Did you guys know that Charity's a prodigy? I didn't either, because we didn't get any video evidence of it yet. like I'm watching Black Swan if that movie were all medium shots and Natalie Portman looked freezing cold. I want to believe that this character Charity is secretly a beautiful dancer, but unless we get a wide shot here, I don't believe she's really doing anything but stepping carefully around tractor parts and weird equipment. Again, I really see what they were going for. You get this beam of light coming through the haze. So it looks like they brought a hazer in and looks like a fog machine that like allows the directional light to be more visible. Or it was just foggy in there with all the body heat. Either way, it looks nice. Why not roll out these new looking orange tractors? That way you give the girl a large spacious barn to dance in. We can really back up to the wall, have her move back a little, and you can see her dancing around in this big barn. I think that's probably what the writers were picturing when they put this on the page. But then when you get on set, you're, you feel sort of like, oh, this is not what I pictured, but I'm just gonna shoot it here as best I can. That's when I think it really helps to have a good sense of command over your set. You ask the location owners, can we get these tractors out of here? It would really help the shot a lot. Is there any 
way in the thing we can do. You're like, what what are our options? Or when you're location scouting, think ahead and you're like, maybe this doesn't need to be in a barn. If we can't show her legs, how are we gonna show that she's dancing? Then again, it might also be a practical thing because she's not a trained dancer and they didn't want to show her feet just like fake ballet dancing. What do you think is the reason? I would love to hear it. This bully kid, Walter, is really getting on my nerves and it's time for the kids to stand up. Oh, wait. Move, Rudy. What happened to turn the other cheek? Okay, okay, hey, stop, stop it. Stop. What is going on? Well, everyone is supposed to be different ages, but it's hard to tell because they're all the same height. I'm assuming because of high protein diets for the children. Oh, and also they're trying to use crew members to make it look like this is a wake full of people, but that's not working either. The kids have a powwow in the basement where they're like, you know, it's kind of like their come to Jesus moment, if you will, since it's pure flex, and Hannah finds a way to get through. I didn't like that Hannah and Charity came into the house together when it's like, I thought they could have had a scene there where she like, was like, you're a beautiful dancer. And she's like, that's how I talk to my mom and dad. Maybe Maybe that'll come later, but when they came in the house together, it made me feel like there was a scene that got cut. Plus, Charity's action in this scene makes me feel that way too, like we missed something. Look, I know that this really sucks. That just swore at us. Are we gonna sit here and take that? Okay, we will, but only because this is our first ever taste of cool older sister vibes. Up until now, it's only been Prue over there, looking like her braces taste sour. All we can do is choose joy. I choose joy. Me too. Me three. Pro, we're having a moment here. Joy it is. Me deciding to watch the Joy Behar show at three in the morning because I can't sleep. Again, I see where the show was trying to go with this I am Spartacus of feeling happy even though your parents and foster parents keep dying. And it does work, but just not as well as it could have with a little more time and perhaps experience across the cast and crew. I would have shot this just not one weird, it's not even over the shoulder, it's like beyond the side of the person's arm. Like I want some close-ups of these kids being like, I'll do it, like give the little kid a close up, but there are also times when there's like the little girl looking right at me, the camera. I hate that I can see these little speakers in the corner of the frame. Like it just makes me feel like, where's the TV that you move removed from that wall? <laughs> the walls are so bare. But you know, in the age of like a self-produced web series, I think this is very passable work. I would keep coming back for more. The kids go upstairs to sing their heart song. My soul. Okay, I'm sure all of the dead are resting peacefully now, right? That's gotta be the case. There cannot be a single thing that Hannah does where Prue does not be like, of course you do. I'm like, okay, sis, we get it. I'm really sorry guys, I have to get this. Of course you do. Come on guys. I feel like the oldest sister, Prue, does not read as old as they want her to because I just don't always buy that she would be telling Charity and the center part kid what to do all the time. They look exactly the same age. Like, what is this sub-dom sibling power dynamic? Let's get rid of it now that the government's gonna be checking in on us, okay? This is why Hollywood would cast a 20-year-old in the role of Prue and a 28-year-old in the role of Hannah because it's like you get that they're, you get what age of adulthood they are at and then the kids are all like substantially far enough apart in ages visibly in height so that you can like differentiate them. Otherwise I get confused and I just see like a general group of middle to high school aged kids. And if none of them are offering to sell me a $1 candy bar as a fundraiser, I lose interest pretty fast. Pretty fast. Give me the caramel one or the crispy rice one. You know what? One of each, all five. Peanut butter one's good too. Hannah is just, you know, kind of staving off a call from her boyfriend, Max, when. Surprise. It's the American Airlines flight attendant who got me an aspirin on the way over here. Just kidding, it's the boyfriend. And like I said, I love when a series knows how to end on a cliffhanger. And I truly did not see this coming right until it happened. I was like, oh, he came back. And I was like, that's fun. It shows his commitment to her and it sets up a new dynamic that I'm excited to see play out in the next episodes. I'm in. If there were a week between episodes, I would be like, I'm gonna come back because I want to know what happens with Max. With other shows on Pure Flix, each installment kind of feels like they just took an arbitrary eight minute slice out of the longer continuous story. So I appreciate the way they're building this up for us. Homeschooled said, no mama, we are doling out the drama in little fun sized chunks, just like the body of Christ that we feast on every Sunday. All hail payment. And that's all she wrote for the first two episodes of Homeschooled, my favorite sitcom that we've discovered on Pure Flix so far. Would you be interested in seeing more of this show? Let me know in the comments below. There's definitely a couple more series that I have not gone into yet with like longer 45 minute episodes. So that'll probably be coming 
coming up soon, but let me know what else you'd like to see this holiday season as we shop around for content to clip breakdown. Also, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see more pure flicks like this. It's a great way to support my channel and I so appreciate it. So is clicking that subscribe button and it's a great way for you to get notified every time I upload new videos, which is twice a week. So turn on those notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm chopping up Jesus into little wafers. Tumble out of bed, chop Jesus into wafers, pour myself a cup of ambition. Also, don't forget I have merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive clip breakdowns and bonus watch parties. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for hailing payment with me today. I will see you next time.